Hey, g'day, it's Prezzo, and welcome back to my workshop today. Now it's 2022, I'm back working on the Titan 60 model aircraft engine. Today we're going to be working on the piston for that engine, and that's the last of the major parts to be made from stock material. The rest of the operations on the engine now are second ops, working on existing parts, and there's a few minor parts for the fuel delivery system. But before I get to that, I want to show you an accessory I made for the welding bench. Now, a while ago I did a video on making an accessory for this welding bench and you could use this on any type of bench, it doesn't need to be made of steel, it doesn't need to be for welding but basically it's a bracket that bolts underneath the bench and it takes a socket which can be attached to any accessory that you want. In the original video I showed how I used this engineer's vise, I also used a small anvil that I had and a socket to take sheet metal stakes. And that's all it is, it's just a piece of steel tube, it's split down one side, it's got a locking lever and it's just bolted underneath the bench there with a couple of screws. And as long as you've got the correct diameter of steel to fit into that socket, you can use it for any type of accessory at all. The one I want to show you today was suggested to me by one of my viewers on that original video. Okay, well this is it. It's nothing more than an old three-jaw chuck. Uh, I got this as part of a wood layer that I bought many years ago. And this spigot here fits inside that socket and there's a loose spacer at the top there which you can remove if you need to. It's also bored all the way through, 16 millimeters, And what it uh, allows you to do is to put that in the socket but don't lock it and you can use that as a sort of a rudimentary weld positioner. You can also place long items down through the spindle and lock them while you work on them. You can grind or sand or polish, whatever you like, any material that's in that chuck there. It can also be locked, of course, so that it won't rotate. And you could uh, put bearings on top of the jaws there and knock out a pin or a shaft from the center of the bearing. And of course it's adjustable, so you can do that for different sizes. So I'm um, sorry I can't remember the name of the person that suggested this, but it's a brilliant idea and it's one of those things that's got like a thousand and one uses. <laughs> and uh, I've got a total of five accessories that go in the socket now and I think this is the last one I'll be doing, but you never know, another one might come along. Anyway, let's get on with the piston for the engine now. Now this is the material we're going to be working with today. Now this is a piece of continuously drawn cast iron bar stock. This piece of material weighs 286 grams. This is the aluminium piston that I made in one of the previous episodes. Now this one weighs 11.61 grams just for the piston, not the connecting rod. And a lot of people were concerned and said, why would you use cast iron to make the piston for this engine? It's too heavy, it's a high revving engine, it's gonna put undue strain and wear and tear on the connecting rod, it's a bad choice. Well, look, the, the bottom line is I don't know why we're using cast iron, but it's specified in these building notes. And when I took on this project, the, the deal was I would make an accurate replica of this engine using these build notes as my guide. So if it says cast iron, that's what we're doing. Uh, personally, I think part of the reason why we're using cast iron is that you can lap cast iron fairly easily. Aluminium would be very hard to lap because you need to use a lap that's softer than this material here. So that would mean using something like lead as your lap. Uh, otherwise you're gonna embed the lapping compound in the piston and not in the lap. So cast iron, uh, I guess, is a lot easier to lap to get to that very, very close fit that's required for this engine because there are no piston rings. So we're relying on the fit between the piston and the, and the liner to get that compression that we need to run the engine. So uh, when I drew this uh, piston in my CAD software, and I did that just so I could sort of make a metric version of this drawing, the CAD software, which is Autodesk Inventor, said that the finished piston in cast iron would weigh 29 grams. So that's roughly three times more than this piston here. So it remains to be seen whether that's gonna be an issue, but I'm just gonna trust the designer <laughs> and hope that he knew what he was doing. Now I do know that there are some of these engines that have been finished and they are running. I didn't know that when I took on this project and I hope and I'm guessing that those people had used this material that was supplied with the kit. Anyway, let's get over the lathe. We're going to start uh, cutting this out. Oh, and one difference between making this piston and this one here is that 
the notes say that we need to stress relieve this piece of stock and that's going to mean a slightly different order of operations than what we use to make this one. So part way through the machining process we're going to stop, we're going to heat this up to red hot and we're going to let it soak, uh, I think it says for about 10 minutes and then we're going to normalize the stock, we're going to let it cool down slowly to relieve any stresses in it and then we're going to finish turn this diameter here. Now that's something I didn't do with the aluminium piston so it's going to mean a slightly different uh, process we're going to use. Anyway, let's get over the lathe. Now that we've faced and center drill that stock, what I need to do is to drill a hole to the depth shown in the drawing which will form the cavity underneath the crown of the piston. Here's a, here's a drawing uh, showing the dimension that I want to hit. And in my last video I made this little DRO to go on the tail stock of my lathe. And the advantage of this is that you can set the tip of the drill perfectly accurately on the surface here and then zero out the DRO and then drill to the depth you want. Now this is a twist drill, I want to be able to uh, form a flat bottomed hole so I'm going to follow up after the twist drill with a, an end mill. This is 3 8 of an inch diameter, this is 9.4 millimeters, which is undersized to 3 8 So this is going to remove the bulk of the material and then we'll follow up with the uh, end mill. So to zero that out I'm just going to use a parallel which is a quarter of an inch thick and we're just going to touch the drill bit on that parallel and then zero the uh, scale here. Now we can remove that and now we can wind the tail stock forward to 6.35 or quarter of an inch and zero the caliper again. Right there it is there, we'll zero that. Now in reality the tip of the drill is now completely level with the surface at the end of the stock here. Now, um, in my last video I made this little gadget to go on the tail stock specifically for this job and a lot of people were really concerned that uh, this play in the quill of the tail stock was going to damage the caliper. Now I thought about that before I mounted it on the machine and uh, all you have to do is rotate the quill in the direction that the drill bit will try to um, load up the quill and then tighten up the uh, socket head screw at that point. So it's already pre-loaded in the direction that the quill wants to rotate under load. Now that means that when you go to release the, the chuck, all right, wind the chuck back the other way, it'll rock it back the other way. Now the important thing to remember here is this is a dirt cheap caliper. It's not a precision instrument and it can tolerate a certain amount of slop. And I actually tried it, I rocked it backwards and forwards and it just rotates on the pin directly underneath the caliper and uh, there are two screws on this side of the caliper here which sort of provide that tension against the side of the scale but it can, it can tolerate some movement so if it completely fails I'm just going to replace the caliper it's 20 bucks but what I'll do long term is replace the key underneath the quilt and that should get rid of all of that, uh, that rotational movement in the quilt anyway let's go ahead and drill this hole Right, target depth there was 20.65. What I'll do now is, is I'm going to bore out the underside of the piston. This is mainly just to remove some mass from the piston itself and then we'll follow up with that end mill to the correct depth.
It's a bit squeaky, but that now is the correct diameter, correct depth, and we're going to follow up now with the end mill to the depth we worked to before, uh, 20.65. Okay, we've got a 3 8 inch end mill and a collet chuck, and we're just going to do the same thing we did before with the drill bit. So I'll bring this in, and we'll just touch the end of that parallel, and zero the DRO. Move in 6.35. Okay, zero that again. Now we're going to drill to the end of the previously drilled hole with that end mill. Well, <laughs> I can't show you up there. Uh, let's put a depth micrometer on it and check it. Okay, on the drawing it shows this should be 20.65. Uh, it's 25. It's 25.5. There it is. That's uh, 15 on the thimble there. So 20.65. Okay, this next bit's going to be interesting. This is a boring bar. I made this from some silver steel and I machined it while it was in the soft state and then I hardened and tempered it. Now I worked out the dimensions of this tool using the CAD drawing that I had and it has to slide down that 3 8 of an inch bore that we've already machined until we get to the correct depth at 20.65 and then we're going to machine outwards. We're going to machine toward the camera to the dimension shown of the DRO. Now all of this has to be done blind. You can't see what you're doing. The only way we're going to know if we've been successful is if we hear some cutting noises and nothing breaks. So um, I'm going to do this uh, with the camera running but you won't see much and uh, in order to set this up I've had to do a lot of uh, tricky things with uh, setting the tool to the end of the piston blank and I did that the same as I did with the end mill and then I've set the tip of the tool off the inside of this bore here and then I've advanced the tool in the correct distance that I've calculated and it just slides into that 3 8 of an inch bore and uh, as I was doing that I was just turning the chuck by hand and just trying to feel for any tight spots seems to be okay let's have a go this is probably the trickiest part of this whole piston build Okay, um, I sort of didn't get to the depth that I wanted. Uh, looks like the boring bar is rubbing on this section here on the neck. Um, I got close, but not perfect. Um, I don't know if it's going to make a big difference. It's really just to lighten the piston slightly. Uh, what we'll do now is go ahead and machine the outer diameter of the piston. We're going to leave it oversized. And once we've uh, normalized it, we can uh, bring it back to its finished dimension and then lap it. the end of my tool gone.
Right, that's still oversized. Uh, it's probably got about 0.2 millimeter oversized on it now, and that'll come off after we've done the normalizing process. But there is the aluminium piston. Uh, it's always a good idea to check that. <laughs> if there are any gross errors, it's going to show up now. Just machined a chamfer on the underside of that piston skirt there now, and I know you can't see it, but there is a recess underneath what will be the piston crown. So I'm going to flip this around now, hold it in a collet, machine it to length, and we're going to reduce the diameter at the end of the piston here, which will form the baffle. Now pretty much all of that material there has got to come off, uh, so I'm going to measure that, get a length, and then we'll uh, set the DRO on this surface here and machine this back to the finished length of the piston. And then all of this larger diameter here has got to come off as well. And in fact the top of the piston is slightly smaller than the skirt, and that's where the baffle will be machined later. I'm just going to check that again. Should be a millimeter to come off the length. Right, that's going to be the top of the baffle later on, not the top of the piston, but the actual baffle that sits on top of that again. And what we need to do now is to machine down a length of that material to form the baffle from. And it'll be smaller in diameter than the main piston diameter. And it'll have a rounded uh, transition up to the edge of the baffle. Okay, that's the section that will be machined into this baffle. So it's slightly smaller in diameter than the actual outside of the piston. And rem remember the outside of the piston's not been machined to its finished dimension yet. Okay, the next operation is going to be done on the milling machine. Next job on the piston is to drill the hole for the wrist pin or the gudgeon pin. And that means finding the exact center of that cylindrical part in the vise. I've got this resting on two parallels. I packed the the, uh, the fixed jaw parallel out a bit so it's not bearing on this reduced section here and I'm going to use the Joe Pie method for finding that center and I've never done this before uh, I've always used like a wiggler or an edge finder and I always thought this method was too time consuming or too fiddly but turns out it's not <laughs> I got this dialed in in literally in minutes uh, probably almost as quick as using an edge finder so uh, I've set the stop on the quill so that it always goes down the same depth. And of course, all you gotta do is just rock the indicator backwards and forwards until it zeroes out or bottoms out, and then repeat that process on the other side. And the good thing about this is you get visual confirmation that you've got it right. So you can see where the hand is on the dial. When you use a wiggler, you're just relying on that sort of, um, that point where it flicks and you may or may not get it right, and you never really know. But with this, you, you can see immediate feedback if you got it right. Now, I will have to use an edge finder to work out the distance from this end of the skirt up to the center point of that pin, but that's probably less critical in getting that right.
uh, that's my offset that's going to be the center of the drill hole. Now you may notice I put a bit of sharpie on that surface there and scribed off the position of the drilled hole just as a, a secondary check. And the next two operations now are all going to be done reference to that hole position. So that's the slot on the underside of the piston for the connecting rod and the baffle on the top of the piston. So we're actually going to use that drilled hole as a setting up aid. The next operation is to mill that slot on the underside of the piston and it needs to be 90 degrees to the board hole we just put through and reamed. And when I set this up, uh, not this one, but the original prototype that I made, I, it was a pretty cack handed job to be honest. Um, I had a steel rod through that reamed hole and I was trying to indicate that steel rod to get it square to the vise. I didn't have the V-block in at that point, I was just sort of resting it. Um, how did I do that? I think I just had a homemade V-block in the back there. But then afterwards I thought I should be using the inherent accuracy in this V-block here. So that steel rod has now been sharpened to a 90 degree angle. When that goes through the reamed hole, it just automatically aligns the uh, reamed hole with the front face of that V-block. So what I'll do now is I'll just put a piece of copper in behind this moving jaw to protect the stock and then we'll indicate in this uh, bore here and that will give us the exact center of the piston and then we can set up to do the slot. Now I can use exactly the same process when I go to machine the baffle on the top of the piston. It will automatically align it with this, uh, this hole here at the correct orientation. So let me get that done and we'll come back and mill that slot. Okay, I think we're good to go there. I've got a 3 8 uh, end mill in there, but my only problem is I've got a lot of stick out in order to clear the top of the V-block there. I can get to the depth that I want, but uh, I'm just going to take it easy. So I've got a mill 5.5 millimeters either side of center, and I'll use the DRO to keep track of that. And I'm just going to plunge the cutter down at regular intervals and then do a clean up pass when we're done. So um, when I did this in aluminium, it was easy. Cast iron's a, a different animal altogether, though. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Okay, looks good. Okay, there's the end result and the connecting rod fits in there quite nicely. And you'll notice that there is a slightly larger bore right in the center of the piston. And I'm pretty sure that happened when I was using that little boring bar in the lathe to undercut the crown of the piston. I'm pretty sure the neck of the boring bar was rubbing on the edge of the hole and that's just sort of enlarged it slightly. Now on the drawing it shows that there's actually a half inch hole meant to go in the center of the piston there and that I think was to clear that boring bar. 
Uh, I went much tighter than that, so I don't think it's going to be a problem. And uh, what we do now is get on to the baffle, and we're going to use exactly the same setup. Alrighty, uh, you're going to have to excuse the rain on the roof. We've got an ex-tropical cyclone moving up the coast, and it's turned into a rain depression and lots and lots of wind. Uh, we'll press on regardless. Now, this is the setup that I'm going to use for doing the baffle on top of the piston. Now, I bought these V-blocks specially for doing this job because they're a lower profile. It means I can get the smaller diameter cutters in closer to the crown of the piston. And this is a variation on what I showed you before. So this quarter inch pin has been uh, machined out at the end there to fit in the slot in the bottom of that V-block. So with that pin pressed in there, it once again automatically aligns the cross hole with the um, center line of that V-block. And what I'll need to do then is to get in and machine away most of the top of the piston, leaving behind a ridge in this, uh, well, toward one side, which is one sixteenth of an inch thick. So I can set this up higher in the V-block so I can get at all of that. So it's going to go roughly there. And I've got room now to cut down below the top of the piston. So I'll get this set up, get it centered, and we'll do the machining. Right, that's now machined to full depth, but I've got one sixteenth of an inch material still left on the edge of the baffle, and I'm going to take that out now, but I'm going to stop short at the bottom, and that will just leave a small amount to take out with that little ball nose end mill, and I'll do the same thing on the other side. Right, you can see that little step in the corner there, that will come out later on to form a fillet. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side, but I'll do that off camera. Oh, that's turned out pretty good. Uh, I tell you what, this is mentally exhausting doing this sort of work. It's all DRO work, uh, even though I had to mark out on top there, that was just uh, a double check. So you've got to keep track of all your axes, make sure you're zeroing things properly. But um, the profile in there is looking good now. And the next step is heat treating this. Uh, we'll see how we go. May not have time in this video, but uh, let me edit this together and then we'll work out where we are. Okay, I just checked the edit on what I shot today and I'm at my self-imposed limit of half an hour for these videos, so I'm gonna have to wind up here now. But before I do that, I just thought I'd uh, show you how we got on with predicting the mass of this cast iron piston. So let me just turn on my little drug dealer scales here. And we got 30.58 grams. Now, Inventor, said it was going to be 29 grams. And don't forget, we're not quite finished yet. We've still got to skim uh, some allowance off the outside of the piston there and do some honing with this. But Inventor does this really neat trick. You can build a model or make the model, and then you can assign a material to it. Now that material could be anything you like. It can be brass, copper, aluminium, wood. And once you've done that, you can look at the eye properties for that part. And in the eye properties, it will display the mass, which is what we were after, but it'll also show you the surface area, the volume, the center of gravity, all sorts of engineering data is in the eye properties for that part. And you can update it as you go. So if you decide that cast iron's too heavy, you can substitute a different material and work out what the mass will be after that. So it's a, it's a neat trick and uh, it's very useful in some situations when you want to design a part with a particular center of gravity or mass. Okay, now, um, 
Before I finish up today, I just want to show you uh, something interesting that happened recently with my Touch DRO setup. Now you may know if you watch uh, my videos for a while there, I'm a bit of a fan of Touch DRO. But uh, lately the relationship's been a bit rocky. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's have a look at that. Okay, this is my Touch DRO setup and I've been using this now for over 12 months and I totally love it. Uh, the reason I like it is that it's very visual in nature. So when you're doing things like tool offsets and bolt hole circles, you see a graphical representation on the screen and that suits the way I do things. Now this is the updated version of the Bluetooth adapter. I'll show you that. And this was sent to me by Yuri from Yuri's Toys. Now he markets these units. He thought I might like to give some of these units away as prizes when I did my 15,000 subscriber draw. So a number of people got them and I kept one of the updated ones. And with the, the new version, the display is absolutely rock steady. Uh, with the original one that I purchased, these, these digits would flicker backwards and forwards and it was a bit annoying but didn't really affect the way the unit worked. So when I got this new one, I was, I was very, very happy with it until I wasn't. <laughs> So what was happening was I was making parts and they had errors and I couldn't figure out why that was happening. Now one day I was turning the mill off and I was watching the display at the same time and I noticed that say X and Y axis digits changed by fairly significant amounts like whole millimeters. And I thought that's odd um, and never seen it before. So I sort of uh, did a couple more starts and stops and it seemed to be okay. So I thought it was just a random event. However, it kept occurring and uh, one day I decided I would just do some tests to see what was causing this. Now, in the meantime, I got in touch with Yuri and he suggested that I run the Bluetooth adapter from one of these uh, phone battery banks. And I was doing that to see if that might be the issue, that it was actually getting a ground loop through the main supply to the Bluetooth adapter. So. I started doing starts and stops on the mill and all of a sudden the machine stopped, the main spindle motor stopped and it wouldn't restart. And I thought, oh, I've damaged something, I've broken a contact or something like that. So let me show you the main switch box and then we'll talk about what actually happened. Okay, this is inside the main electric cabinet for the Bridgeport mill. There are two contactors, the bottom one is for the coolant pump and the top one for the main spindle motor. Now, it turned out that the coolant pump was fine, it was operating normally, but this contactor appeared to be dead. So I took it out, tested it on the bench and it tested fine, put it back in again, still no luck. Uh, then, uh, in desperation, I took the contactor out again, thinking I'd overlook something. As I was taking it out, I noticed that the three phase wires coming out the top terminal block, where it went into the base of this plug here, were loose. And in fact, one of the wires was completely burnt off and there it is there. So I think what was happening was that those wires were making contact originally but as I was starting and stopping the mill to do this test on the DRO the heavy current draw heated that junction up until it just simply failed. Now when I got in touch with Yuri I said I think I found the problem and he agreed. He said that when you have a contact like that arcing or sparking it will act like a radio transmitter and then that can upset either the scales or the Bluetooth adapter. And I think this was an accident waiting to happen. Uh, it, could have, um, it could have failed a lot sooner and probably in more dramatic ways than what it did. So I'm glad I found the problem and my Touch DRO is now working again. I'm totally happy with it again. <laughs> so if you own a Touch DRO unit and you're noticing these random uh, resets, just check all your electrical connections. You may have the same problem that I had, and uh, that could be a way of resolving it. Anyway, I'm gonna finish up here now. I'm gonna uh, get back to you with the next video. We'll do the finished machining on the piston. We'll do the heat treating and the finished uh, machining and the honing. And we'll see if we can get all that done. And then we're getting pretty close to the end. So it's Prezzo signing out. Thanks for watching. See you on the next video.